I guess we can take a few minutes to let everyone join. I see many people and many known people, which is a pleasure, as always. And, and as we wait, thank you very much for your time today. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to discuss. Uh, well, it's a pleasure. And thank you for hosting the session. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, both the vision of Adia Lab, let's say, but also I discovered many hidden gems in your papers, uh, even 20 years uh, old, which are, which is always nice to, okay. to, to find out. So, yeah, I mean, while we wait, everyone joining, I guess I can once again uh, read out the, the statement of this webinar, uh, which is about, the, which starts from the multidisciplinarity of uh, uh, Adia Lab, let's say, and how uh, this uh, multidisciplinary perspective uh, uh, has something that has to do with big data. And, uh, and then we arrive at your research field, which is the use of not only artificial intelligence, that's heard everywhere nowadays, but it's also about the use of high performance computing and uh, high dimensional linear algebra to solve uh, problems yeah. associated with this quantitative uh, description of such systems. Um, so I guess we can start from there. I, I would like you to I would like to leave you the floor for this initial uh, part in which you I'd like you to introduce yourself and uh, the efforts you're you're leading uh, within Adia Lab and the vision of Adia Lab, mostly. Thank you, Matteo, and good afternoon. I'd like to welcome all the attendees. And I'm quite sure that many of the attendees are current participants in the current data challenge that CrunchTower organizes so ably for uh, Adia Lab. So I want to say Thank you for your participation. Thank you for your enthusiasm. And I want to wish you greatest of success and big inspiration and great algorithmic prowess that you can get the best solution and hopefully win part of the prize pool. Uh, so I will come back to this competition in a minute, but let me first say a little bit about Adia Lab. With that, uh, the lab was started about six months ago in December 22, and I started in January 23. So uh, what we've done so far here at the lab is <clears throat> a couple of things you've seen, but in terms of the actual research, decided, decided to focus on three application areas and two basic technologies that are important. The three application areas are climate, health and uh, digital currency, so central bank uh, currency, uh, CBDC, and uh, then use a basic research in high performance computing and AI to enable these type of applications. So uh, Adia Lab is therefore a very much application focused uh, lab. And I would say that my history in the US national lab system is that we always did mission driven basic research. That is, it is important to solve a big problem and keep your focus and your eye on the big problem. Uh, but do try to solve this problem with tools of basic research. Mm -hmm. So when people hear a research lab, they think, oh, I'll come in and sit at my desk and think about what I'm going to do today. But that's not. We are there to solve uh, some of the big and challenging problems. So that's the overall framework. And uh, so some of the interesting things that we've done, and I would like to thank you for it. One is the competition that many of you are involved in. The reason why this is important is, is because I believe in the wisdom of a crowd and the wisdom of a crowd is, is that if you ask a large number of people for a good solution, then on average, they will find the solution and maybe the, the uh, large number of participants, a few of them will have better ideas than all the rest. And so that's one of the reasons we're looking at this. Another one is, is that, and I also would like to encourage you, if you're working in this field, to look at causality and there's a best paper competition, we are asking for papers written about the use of causality arguments in financial 
research and financial application research. And this is another good example. Uh, causality has been as a tool around probably for more than 20 years from Julia Pearl's breakthrough work in the 1990s. But the application of the causality work was, for example, much more in the health sciences, in data trials and in mm -hmm. drug trials. And uh, it has not been widely used in uh, the financial world. In the financial world, unfortunately, a lot of people still look for correlation and not for causality. And so, therefore, there is, is a good example where there are some application areas where uh, there's work being done that can be transitioned and leveraged from those application areas also into the financial services. Right. So this is my general overview. And I should say that Adia Lab is a, I said, is a basic research lab. So all we're doing is, is open, will be published and is for common good. So there's not anything proprietary being done. And uh, that's very important also for us to compete in the marketplace of ideas in the basic science world. Right. And with that, Thank I hope you. I get a bit of an overview. I'd be happy to answer questions, but I'd like to turn it back to Matteo, who has yeah, a couple thank of you. questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, by no means, uh, the chat is open for everyone to ask questions. So uh, go forward for it if you if you want. Um, the, the example of causality is really interesting of the value of this uh, cross-disciplinarity and uh, bringing things that are obvious for some communities, but uh, not so well known and uh, used in other fields. Um, I see, uh, I mean, we, we had a chat about this before, about the the tension and the dialogue between high performance computing and artificial intelligence, uh, which are different terms, but one could say that they're both dealing with uh, powerful computers, powerful digital computers, uh, pushed forward by PhDs in dark rooms. Uh, so in this sense, they share something. Uh, what is your view of, the, of these two cultures, let's say, and... Uh, how one is enabling the other, or one was a precursor to the other, or one is, uh, I don't know, uh, forgetting the the lesson learned from the previous uh, attempts. Yes, uh, thank you, Ma Th thank you, Matteo. Um, and uh, I always, I like to answer that question with a tweet that from Daniel Bowers, who is at Hewlett Packard at HPE, he said, HPC and and he's saying this of course in a little bit of tongue and cheek. HPC and AI are totally different. HPC is large, expensive clusters of GPUs running arcane algorithms from PhDs who belittle AI. But AI is large, expensive clusters of GPUs running arcane algorithms from PhDs who belittle HPC. Uh, so this uh, captures quite a bit. Certainly, I'm coming from the high-performance computing community. The HPC community is much older. It's now probably a 30-year-old community. They look at AI as the newcomers to rediscover many things that have been done in HPC long ago. And But in reality... Uh, these two communities do exactly the same. In order to solve, they solve very large problems, complex problems with complicated, with complex algorithms and using the same tools, that is large clusters of GPUs. So there's a lot in common. And I think both communities can learn quite a bit from each other. Uh, so let's see. While I was speaking, I was also trying to find the reference to the book, The Idea Factory, and I put this in the chat. Ah, great. So uh, I hope uh, whoever asked that question has seen the link to Amazon. Uh, great. Okay. Great. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, I have to tell you, uh, in preparation to this webinar, uh, on LinkedIn, I saw a discussion between physics-informed neural networks in fluid dynamics yes. and, uh, and uh, grid-free methods 
which have been around for decades now. And I guess, yeah. uh, I, I don't know if it's frustrating from your perspective to see people uh, claim to have, re to have discovered something that doesn't even have a proof of convergence. Uh, well, you had uh, all this yeah. rigorous machinery. Um, uh, I, I had a question about this, let's say more in general about uh, your your research uh, in high performance computing. Uh, how you kind of mentioned this in saying that uh, the goal is really high, but the research is really fundamental. But how does this uh, uh, structure the daily to, the day to day work uh, at, uh, at an institutions like uh, Lawrence Berkeley or now Adia Lab? So we, that's an interesting question. Maybe I should answer more about Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And I think uh, one of the important elements I enjoyed in a place like Berkeley Lab was that we always worked in large groups and we always approached things in an interdisciplinary way. And so what I very much enjoyed is when there was a new problem coming up uh, that I could bring people together from physics, from chemistry, from material science, from computing, from the environmental science, from energy technologies. And they're all working on these problems together. And uh, so I think a good example was at the beginning of COVID, mm -hmm. uh, I had, I had at that moment some discretionary funding and I said, whoever has some research ideas that could help in the, in the space uh, with COVID. And so I got instantly some 10 or 15 proposals of ideas and it was intriguing to see different people coming together. Mm -hmm in particular to also get uh, people from the physics area, from the accelerator division coming up with ideas on how to use high performance accelerators to uh, help in sanitizing equipment. And so uh, there was also some interesting work being done by uh, our indoor air quality group and this is obvious and that they jumped on this is that they we have an air conditioning simulation or a internal air simulation or room where you can build an office and do measurements and then they were doing some measurements and using that equipment for trying to understand the behavior of the uh, corona virus in an indoor environment and so what I'm really intrigued is uh, bringing different people together for solving uh, problems in an interdisciplinary way. And I'm looking towards establishing the same type of collaborative interdisciplinary uh, setup at Adia Lab. Now what's different at Adia Lab is this Adia Lab is relying much more on international collaborations and external participants so we have already started a very deep collaboration with Spain, which was uh, intriguing because it came about through a visit by uh, the Spanish Deputy Secretary for, for Digitization and AI. Mm -hmm. And she basically suggested uh, us to engage with Spanish researchers. And so now we have a five research programs of Spanish universities where Adia Lab is contributing to these research programs, supporting the local UAE researchers and bringing them together with Spanish researchers. I'm using this because this is another way of building large collaborations and bringing the intellectual talent and the brains from across the world to Abu Dhabi. And this is, in a sense, another thing that I'm trying to accomplish and the, just come back to the competition. Mm -hmm. This is another way to tap in the worldwide reservoir of great ideas and finding the best ones and hopefully connecting them to Adia Lab. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Sorry to talk so long, but uh, you can't. No, no, no. Great. Uh, uh, actually, <laughs> you have to stop me to think about the competition because, I mean, all the things you're saying. Uh, uh, yes. Thinking about the well, I mean, quite, quite frankly, this is, we're we're looking. At, this is a 
uh, is to get ideas and to get people interested in Adia Lab and in Abu Dhabi, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I encourage everyone competing. Uh, I'm sure, let's say that this the multidisciplinarity, these uh, uh, different approaches uh, yes. that uh, is reflected. Let me talk mathematical, yeah. but in the orthogonality of the submissions and in the and the value that his originality has from a mathematical perspective. But I'm sure that this is caused by some different backgrounds. Uh, I'm I, uh, many people in the community are not from uh, don't have a finance background. And as you and as you should with the causal inference example, these backgrounds can be helpful for finance for sure. Um, so uh, let me please uh, go a bit deeper with your research because I was really fascinated by the work you did in the late nineties about the recursive spectral bisection algorithm. Yes. Uh, and I have to say that I have to anticipate to this the fact that. Uh, Years back, months back, I was really interested in operator linear operator theory in the understanding of chaotic dynamical systems, and uh, so I, I bring with me this uh, this this fascination for uh, linear methods, li a linear framework for for strongly nonlinear and high dimensional problems. So yes. I, I'm, I'm curious to to understand how this interest in this field came to be, and how you ended up uh, with this. Well, idea. as I said, I was I'm always interested in uh real problems and how they can be solved mathematically and actually the origin of the recursive spectral bisection goes back to a paper about computational geography which is not a particular uh, well-established field but there was somebody who wrote a paper who uh, looked at why moscow became the dominant city in russia and he looked at uh, the water network in Russia at the Rus time in the 9th or 10th or 11th century and mm -hmm. drew a graph on how those different waterways were interconnecting and then drew this graph and then said, had a theory and said, let's suppose that there is a flow of people and of commerce along all these waterways. Where is the uh, strongest flow of goods. And so when you mm -hmm. think about this, this is really a problem which says, let's find uh, the dominant node in this network. And the dominant mm -hmm. node in this network can be identified by looking at the steady state of the flow. That's, of course, the dominant eigenvector of a, of a graph. And the city with the largest entry in this eigenvector is the most dominant city, and this happened to be Moscow. And so there was something like a geographic uh, determinism that made Moscow, among many similar small towns, to be predetermined to become the central city of in, in Russia. I was very fascinated by this. And so uh, that was the first time that I got intrigued by the question of can you solve graph problems through a through spectral methods. And mm -hmm. this is what brought me to the spectral bisection. And I had an approach that was wrong. And then I would say the second thing. So if I draw some lessons here for everybody, the first mm -hmm. lesson is be always interested in things that are seeming on the fringes of what you're what you really researching. And you'll find lots of inspiration from other fields. The second one is uh, go to conferences and also go sometimes to conferences and listen to things that you're not interested in. So I went to a conference, the SIAM conference on discrete math, and I was living in the San Francisco Bay Area at the time. I only went there because it was local, and I said I can just drop by and listen to some talks. And I ran into a research, so this was 1990 or thereabouts. So mm -hmm. I ran to a researcher from Slovenia, uh, from Ljubljana, and he gave an interesting talk and we got into talking and he told me basically that what I want to do is do spectral bisection. And his name is Boham Murhar. He is now a professor at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. I haven't seen him since the 1990s. And I always repeat the story and say I'm thankful for this conversation at a conference that got me started on this. Right. So, uh, what was the topic? Um, Sorry, uh, discrete uh, mathematics. How did you call it? A SIAM conference on discrete uh, mathematics. Thank okay. 
Interesting. Interesting. And what is it about? Let's say, if you can well, it's try to mostly describe on, the yeah, algorithm. Yeah, it's mostly on graph. Was a lot of graph algorithms and graph theory. Right. And uh, in a sense, all the fundamentals of computer science nowadays. Uh, so um, I think graph algorithms are probably the most interesting part of that conference. Right. But also combinatorics or com combinatorial problem and also I think to some part combinatorial optimization so things that are dealt with uh, groups or finite fields and if you're talking mm -hmm. mathematical terms right. anyway so that's not my field but I was always interested so I said always be interested and find also people to talk to inspiration comes from many different corners and so <clears throat> the actual idea i mentioned this already before is sort of a, a since matteo said make it also a bit personal <clears throat> the idea for the algorithm i had when my son who was an infant at the time couldn't sleep you know i was rocking him to sleep sitting on the sofa and then when he finally fell asleep, I sort of thought about the problem. And then I said, yeah, that's how you do it through recursion. So the recursive idea occurred to me in this moment of relaxation. Okay. Okay. So the story, uh, the story of, uh, who Oops. was it? Uh, uh, I don't remember. Someone uh, was recommended to take a bath after thinking a lot about the problem. Yes. Yes. This is so famous. Yeah. So Archimedes. another example. Archimedes, right. Yeah, 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 right. So you you bring your uh, your own uh, Eureka moment with you. Um, so the, these techniques uh, you're using, the, the spectral perspective, uh, um, you've been using it also for clustering and uh, understanding. Yes, so uh, there were many papers that I did with a, a colleague, Chris Ding, who was very intrigued by the idea, and he found <clears throat> many ways of applying it, and I also. I wanted to apply it in the early days of the World Wide Web to find uh -huh. uh, some, just like Moscow was the central city in the water, works, uh, water network in Russia. I said the same thing can be applied to the World Wide Web, but the results were not as striking. And it, uh, but this also is, an, so there's some papers and I don't think they were particularly important. But the other thing was that in, in order to apply this, this was my first encounter with very large uh, graphs and large data, and where it became important to use high-performance computing for these type of applications. Mm -hmm. So this was sort of the same time when Google uh, did their fundamental work, which uh, Page and Bryn did their work at Stanford, which looked at the web graphs, but they had mm -hmm. the right idea. But that was also, if you look at, there's also a spectral idea in the fundamental page rank algorithm that Google published in 96 or 97. Mm -hmm. So about how the Google algorithm really works and how you get pushed to yes. the so recommendation Google system. The algorithm. But that I always say the other thing you learn about Google is that you have to have a great algorithm, but it doesn't make a great company. You've got to have many other things. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um, I guess after this uh, discussion, uh, I, I wanted to ask you about Moore's Law. I mean, now you mentioned Google. Uh, I saw recently that the, uh, I mean, I think 2022 was the, the year in which uh, on the one hand, uh, NVIDIA was saying that Morse law is dead, and Intel was actually saying that Morse law is alive and well. Um, so I don't know, um, in your history with high-perform computing, how you, let's say, you you thought of well, Morse law, but yeah. what, what is your vision today about this? Well, so, of course, Moore's law has to come to an end. Very simply, it's a physical limitation. So you cannot shrink transistors mm -hmm. smaller and smaller because at some point you have shrunk transistors to a size that is, if you go on this straight, uh, this 
periphery decline, you get to a point when you have when you don't have any more atoms around. So you have a transistor, which is uh, less than 10 atoms and then less than one atom, and you cannot build a transistor anymore with, with that. So clearly there's a size limitation, but then there's also a cost limitation and a manufacturing limitation. And this is what we've seen already in the current uh, semiconductor world, but it's becoming more and more expensive to build a large semiconductor manufacturing plants. It's always important to keep in mind that in the 1970s, when basically the microprocessor revolution started, uh, Intel probably had to spend about tens of millions of dollars to build a fab line. And now we're in a tens of billion dollars. So it's a factor mm -hmm. of a thousand uh, increasing cost for building state-of-the-art manufacturing. So uh, how much more of this, this capital, high capital cost is something that is also deriving the uh, CHIPS Act in the US and other investments into uh, developing new technology and developing better manufacturing capability. But clearly we are coming to the end of Moore's law of just simple scaling. Now that doesn't mean that the semiconductor industry is at the end. There is, there are, in a way, I think there are three directions where things can go. One direction is architecture, building better architecture. And this is where GPUs come in because GPUs are building a change to fundamental architecture of chips and build it these large many core chips that can do certain applications. For example, handling of matrices as matrices coming out of previously as graphics and gaming, but then in the same way the matrices that are used in machine learning. So there are these architectures that are built towards machine learning application. And I think a perfect example of this change in architecture is not just the NVIDIA GPUs, but we had just a couple of days ago, a company called Cerebras announced that they are building in collaboration with G42 here in the UAE, this a very large system based on the Cerebras process, and that's an architectural accomplishment. So one direction is changing architecture. The second direction, this is maybe something we can, can be done now and will be done in the next decade. The second direction is to change the underlying technology. So uh, all the chips have been built out of CMOS, but there are many other materials and there has been a lot of uh, promising research in looking into different uh, architecture, uh, into different materials and so mm -hmm. ferrous, fer materials in uh, for example very promising technology so a lot of there are probably 20 or 30 different approaches that material science electrical engineers have approved. this may take a, more than a decade to come in that direction but uh, that would be the second tier to look and the mm -hmm. third one is to do completely different computing and this is where quantum computing falls in or neuromorphic computing, brain-like computing, or many other ideas that have been proposed to do different computing technology altogether. And this may take more than 20 years to reach mm -hmm. maturity. All right. What is the second example you mentioned of non-digital uh, computing? Uh, pardon? You mentioned after quantum computing. Uh, quantum uh, neuromorphic, that's brain-like computing. Okay. And Which so is based on quantum. Uh, no, quantum no, this would, no, this would be there are so called neuromorphic chips, which are built uh, like basically the synapses and uh, neurons in the brain. So, a good example is the a colleague of mine, Dharmendra Moda at IBM, did a wonderful paper about five years ago on something called True North, where he built a neuromorphic processor. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, is that interestingly, this is my standard example is, is that if you look at the brain, 
the brain only takes 20 watt power. Mm -hmm. And if you would want to build a computer today that has brain-like capabilities, more or less, it would be probably a 20 megawatt computer, it would be an exaflop type computer. And so there's a million difference in power consumption. Why is that? And why are the big computers huge boxes that take up that much power? And this is, there's something inherent in the architecture of the brain that we have not yet explored yet and that we mm -hmm. need to understand. And so that's a direction to build computers that are more brain-like. Interesting. It's called neuromorphic computing. Interesting. I was not aware of the term. Um... I, I, I would have many questions, but uh, let me uh, read out uh, Adrian's yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a question in the chat about uh, your stance on open sourcing machine learning and AI codes. How could it drive? Well, I am an open source supporter, a strong supporter, I think, uh, for some for several reasons. One is, is that in the philosophy that I say here, that we'd like to have the best ideas participating, having an, a community that can look at a code and the community will in aggregate make the best improvements and will de deliver the best technology. And that's one. And the other one is, is that we also need to have transparency we want to understand what is going on in these codes. And I think this is a current problem is this that we really don't know what many of the large language models are actually doing and producing. So um, now uh, the regulations in the future, that's in the question. I'll pass on this. I am not an expert on AI regulations. Generally, I think that um, there is a point in having regulations for safety and we definitely need to think about that aspect of it but i'm actually not an expert and i would say yes we mm -hmm. should think about safety regulations just like for any technology it is important to have safety regulations and nobody complains about wearing seat belts in a car or not smoking in an airplane or and these are just fundamental things and we just haven't come to understand a machine learning and AI technology well enough to have mm -hmm. the equivalent of seat belts and no smoking signs attached to the large language models. Right. Things yeah. that everybody can agree to and everybody mm -hmm. understands mm -hmm. why we need to do this. Yeah, yeah. And also, it seems to me, I mean, now this is a big topic because of, as you mentioned, large language models, but even the recommendation systems of uh, something like Google or uh, social media like uh, Twitter, for example, uh, uh, it, it, there is something in the algorithm that uh, could be valid, it, that is powerful and could be yeah. be associated with safety. Uh, I mean, I guess this is a discussion going back uh, since the, the, the start of the web. GPUs versus FPGAs. And I think the FPGAs have always the versatility argument that's true, but they are not as well performance tuned as GPUs. This is the... Could you maybe give two words about FPGA for people that don't know? FPGA says field program or gate arrays. So this is basically the notion that you can configure the hardware to do certain things the way you'd, you can program for hardware. And this is, of course, the element of versatility, but you always treat trade of versatility and performance. And so the FPGA performance just, but well, has gone up, has never been able to catch up with the special purpose machines like GPUs. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are many applications where FPGAs are perfectly suited, but in a mass market and so the advantages is that GPUs have opened up a mass market for themselves. You can get more innovation and more performance quickly out of a special purpose than out of a general purpose approach. Right. 
And about these choices of architecture, I mean, I was uh, reading about analog computers. Uh, did you ever encounter analog computers in your research? And uh, yeah. Not in my research, but I had an analog computer when I was in the military. I was in the artillery and we uh -huh. had this old box, which was really a mechanical calculator, which uh, computed uh, the how you had to adjust the art of the cannons basically right. uh, so to get on target and this was really an analog computer because it had some dials and uh, uh, displays which were just like old odometers and so uh, I don't actually know how they work but uh, no I have not worked with analog computers but I'd like to think of um, actually the biggest potential of quantum computers in something which is akin to analog computing because the quantum simulation is probably the biggest potential for quantum computer. And unfortunately, that has gone a little bit in the background. By quantum simulation, I mean, is you build a quantum computer to simulate quantum systems. And mm -hmm. my favorite example where I'll try to uh, illustrate this is there's something called RREs, and you may have seen this. This is what astronomers built in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. These are these uh, systems of little balls and wheels. And they were simulating, for example, the motions of the planets and the moons in the solar system. So you were turning a crank. Right. And then you could see how the planets were moving and you could compute uh, uh, their alignments and and, and so what you had, so the same way a quantum simulation should simulate the behavior of complex molecules at the, at the basically quantum level. Mm -hmm. And uh, this would be an analog computer really. And so I have not heard much okay. effort being put into quantum simulation, but I believe that quantum simulation might be the most promising application for quantum computers because we could for because then we could simulate quantum systems much more effectively and this is still one of the big uh, promises of quantum computing that you could uh, find uh, this whenever you ask a quantum computing enthusiast they say oh we can solve the energy problems because we know how to Will fixate nitrogen, and we can find a better way mm -hmm. of uh, building, of creating fertilizer or uh, building better batteries. And so, yes, that's all true. But uh, I think what's missing yet is so, anyway, this is just another thought that I have and I could debate with. Anybody. Right. So, I'm veering off too far off topic. So, let me come back to Adia Lab. What does it all have to do with Adia Lab? And I think, let me just put this back in and just say that we just had a short announcement since I'm talking about quantum computing to work with a quantum computer company, Rigetti. And uh -huh. so Adia is exploring to use the use of quantum computers for doing um, some uh, financial applications. And so we want to identify uh, sort of a what type of uh, probability distribution is underlying a mm -hmm. process. And so, uh, and uh, Alexei, uh, who is mm -hmm. doing this, Andradiev, he, uh, he believes that he has a, the right quantum algorithm to solve this fundamental problem. And of course, if you can solve a fundamental problem on a quantum computer that you can't really solve on a traditional digital computer, then you would have quantum advantage. So we're chasing like everybody under quantum advantage, but I think this is a perfect example why we want to look at uh, advanced technologies like quantum computers to understand how they change our, what is possible in finance or in other applications. Right. Let me. I was taking a second to put the link of the book by on uh, quantum. Uh, let me see the title: Quantum Machine Learning and Optimization in Finance yes. on yeah. the Road to Quantum Advantage. 
that's probably of interest for yeah. for people yes. listening um and so it's uh, really interesting to think that uh, quantum computing can be taught as analog computer when dealing with quantum simulations, of course. Uh, yes. But also it's, can be used as a quantum simulation. And I think that's what Richard Feynman actually had in mind when he was talking about quantum simulation. Right. And in this other case, in which the idea is to approximate uh, probability distributions, the technology, how, how is the quantum technology helpful, let's say? This one, I think I should leave to Alexei to come <laughs> back and explain to you. And I don't know that yet. I'm, okay. uh, I guess it's time for me to buy the book then. Yeah. So there is something in his book called The Quantum Born Machine. And he believes that this is... This is uh, often people call things a machine, which is not a piece of hardware, but an algorithmic approach, like support vector machine, for example. Right. And so this is an algorithmic approach that uh, he thinks will be very conducive to solving for big problems. Fascinating topic, uh, uh, definitely. Um... I would like to, of course, ask if people have any other question, but um, I had a, a personal question I'm interested in, which is uh, if you were a fresh undergrad today, yeah. given all these topics you are now facing with Adia Lab, but also the trajectory of your research uh, in the in the previous yeah. decades, you, have a, you, you can pick any PhD. Where, where do you go? What do you do with your academic life? Well, I would start by uh, neuroscience. And I think the reason is because I think there's still very many questions that we don't know about how the brain works. And I think there are at least two topics immediately derived from this that we have already discussed. One is, is that, uh, in a sense, the question on... Um, how can we build, can we use, if we would understand the brain better, can we build better computers? I mentioned, talked about this. This is one possibility. And then another direction is, of course, to say, uh, what, can, what can we say really about uh, uh, artificial intelligence, in, in particular, AGI and is it actually possible to construct a um, sentient AI? And I think so. I would really try to say I'd say I'd like to st say start neuroscience and always keep an eye on the computing relationship. Interesting. Well, thank you very much for sharing this. Uh... I hope it's uh, it's guiding the listeners to well. To look maybe into. I should say should say something else. I have another topic that is related to this, and I give you another answer. I was testifying in the U.S. House of Congress on the authorization of the Department of Energy Office of Science bill, mm -hmm. and uh, one congressman asked me a question. And I don't know what exactly I asked, but it was an interesting thing that I answered. And I said, um, I, I'm originally uh, from Germany and I went to the US and I studied and I decided that I would be better off and was true in the 1980s for a scientific career to stay in the US. And I told the congressman, I'm not sure today if this is true, Certainly in my field, I think that there is a much more even play field in the world. And so I don't think that is this, I would say I would find again as a foreign student as an important for me to study in the US. Now, this is, I think, and I think when I say this to maybe many of the, I don't know where in the academic career of the listeners in this webinar are, but I think uh, what I'm saying here is, is that uh, in many countries have made huge investments in science. And in particular, I think in the EU is the gap between 
Europe and the US is very much uh, closed in many fields. And so um, I think if you, it's not a field, but if you're looking for where to go, you can find a very great education in many different places. Thank you. It's also all technology is easily accessible and all the information is on the web. And so there are no longer these barriers that have existed before. Mm -hmm. You can talk famous professors using Zoom. So there are no barriers really. Uh, indeed, indeed. Well, once again, let me ask for people if there is any additional question. But... Uh, in the meantime, yeah, um, there was a question about the quantum computing book. So I think Alexis. Uh, yeah, I put uh, the name of Alexis. It's actually, yeah. very, it's I wouldn't say it's a beginner's book, but it's a very accessible book. Mm -hmm. And probably with the references, you can then navigate yeah. a bit. And, uh, once again, the graph and look for the for the beginners. Well. I guess I can thank you for your time. It was a pleasure discussing these topics. Uh, Great. I always like to talk about these things. And <laughs> yeah. we haven't really gotten to my favorite topic. And Which is? Favorite, now, now you have My to favorite see. topic is I firmly do not believe that it's possible to create an AGI. I think that whatever we call intelligence is a human uh, trait that we have not understood yet. So I don't expect any machine that is based on some large language model to have anything like, uh, even if we scale to hundreds of billions or trillions of parameters, we're still not going to get to the core of human intelligence. And if somebody says why, then I say a very simple answer here, it's chemistry. It's because what computers are building is an uh, electric, uh, electronic model. But the human brain is to a large extent chemistry. And so just think about chemistry. The next time you drink a cup of coffee or drink a glass of wine and your thinking and your personality may change. And that's not happening with a large language model because they cannot drink a cup of coffee or a glass of wine or take serious drugs. And it's all chemistry. And so I think we need to build probably different models if we actually... So there are many other arguments, but that's my simple argument, the chemistry argument. Right. So even the other non-digital computers you mentioned that are inspired by the brain structure won't be enough still yeah no i don't think so i think there's things because we still live in in an electronic world and uh, we need to have a different uh, embedded world into chemistry and into uh, bodily sensing and things that make humans different from computers now can this all be simulated maybe but i just don't mm -hmm. believe it I think there's an essence that we don't know yet. That's why I also go back to the question of what uh, to uh, what to study. That's why I think neuroscience will mm -hmm, at this moment mm -hmm. be the most intriguing thing. So do you say maybe in one century, uh, chemical-based computers? Maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> and will those be intelligent? <laughs> yep, we'll see. <laughs> It's too bad I wouldn't be around to see this. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And yeah, well, let's close it with uh, Adrian's for... comment. Creativity is only human, indeed. And uh, thank really you everyone good. for joining. And uh, have a nice yeah. rest of the day. Thank you. Have thank a good evening. Much. And good luck in the competition. Find the best algorithms. <laughs> yeah. Good luck, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.